Lawrence. Um, I'll be talking to you guys about prioritized garbage collection and how we uh, use the garbage collector to support software caching. And this is joint work with my advisor, Sam Geyer at Tufts University, and Emery Berger from UMass Amherst. And I'm going to start off with a bit of a story. As soon as I can get this to work. Okay. Technical difficulties. Off with a different story. So on the left we have browsers, what we normally used to. On the right we have web servers. And we're used to web servers making these requests for, for HTML pages and getting back these HTML documents. So what happens when oh, sorry, what happens when a bunch of browsers or the same browser makes the same request multiple times while the server has to send the same document back multiple times? And we routinely solve this by putting a cache in the middle, so, uh, usually something at the software level. And there are actually programs that just act as caches, the, one of the big ones being the memcache daemon. But that's written in C, which is kind of unsafe in terms of memory. So we'd like to write it in a memory safe program like, oh, I don't know, Java. And so let's see what happens when we uh, look at the performance of this program written in Java. And so we have this graph. On the bottom, we have the number of, uh, the maximum number of cache entries that are allowed in the system. We'll ask this the amount of time that the entire program takes. And we start off with no cache, and we see it takes a while. So maybe adding a cache will help, and it turns out, yes, not only does it help, but as we make it bigger, we, our program runs faster. So we think, well, if we can make it even bigger, it'll run even faster. And no. Now, the question is, why? And especially since it's interesting, because at this point around 600, there's no bar, because our program crashed. And with diving into this, we see that um, actually our program gets, uh, our program runtime is dominated by garbage collection as we increase the number of maximum entries in our cache, and in fact, that's what kills our program. So it's a question of why. Well, we have our cache here. This is our heap, and this is our cache on the side. And a lot of our garbage collection time spend is spent just saying, hey, all these are alive, you're using these, and I'm going to keep them, which we'd like to find a way to uh, minimize that. But there's something else. So let's say we ran, uh, uh, ran, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So let's say you ran this experiment multiple times. You said, hey, we found the perfect cache size. It's whatever this is. There's a slight problem, because while it's perfect for this set of elements, another set of elements could be too small. And while it'll still fit and our program will run, we can always use more space and get a better runtime out of it. But our elements can be too big, and it needs to use less space before it runs out of memory. And finally, there's one other little thing, which is, Let's say we did find the perfect cache size and all of them are perfect size, everything's great. Well, when we evict an item to put something new in here, the evicted item stays in memory. And if we evict more items, we put more back in. So now we, ha we essentially have all of our old elements plus all of our new elements all stuck in the heap, which is gonna end up, giving, end up leaving less room to actually do some useful work. So, is there a way that we can actually keep the garbage collector from dominating our runtime and handle these entries of various sizes? Well, yes, um, we can use soft references. Those are a thing. And soft references are very good because um, they're reclaimed as memory pressure increases. So it's, a, it's sort of a last ditch effort to reclaim memory before we end up, our program falls over and dies from out of mem running out of memory. But looking at the Android documentation, there's a bit of a mismatch. Uh, I'll read you just the first two sentences. In practice, soft references are inefficient for caching. The runtime doesn't have enough information on which references to clear and which to keep. So that's kind of a problem. And in fact, there are most JVMs end up having to do some uh, bit of work to actually remove them during normal operation instead of waiting till the very end. And uh, Hawkman in particular uh, removes them in the least recently used order, which works for some programs but not all. So. Our solution is just, we're going to make the garbage collector aware of these caches and its contents. And to that end, I present two things. One is the prioritized garbage collector, which separates the, the policy of these references from the actual mechanism that, that uh, collects them. So mainly our main, deal is that our main idea is the programmer will decide what the actual policy for those references are. The collector will actually execute that policy and figure out which references to collect. And we're going to use that to build ourselves this thing called a sash to limit the memory used by the values that this data structure stores. So to use a prioritized garbage collector, use stuff from, use any, yeah, to use the prioritized garbage collector, uh, a programmer can request 
a certain space, which is more of a logical space to store the references. We call that a prior space. They can express it in a number of bytes or in a percentage of the heap, in this case, 60%. And what that program will do is, over time, they'll ask for the space for a new reference for a particular object, and they'll get back this uh, prior reference which works like a normal reference in Java, which means particularly you can get the object back from the reference. Obviously, you should check if it's null beforehand, because it might be clear. And particularly for us, what this will do is that it'll tell the space to update the reference. And what do you mean by update the reference? We want to update the priority. So in other words, it's important to the current application. And that's all determined by this compare function. This determines the eviction policy of the space, as, or in other words, the importance of a particular reference when compared to another. And ideally, the higher the, prior, the higher the priority of a reference, the more likely that it should remain in the system. Because for the programmer, that means this is a very this reference and its associated object are very important, and therefore we might end up using that again. And so what happens? So this is the so this, yeah, this is the policy. The mechanism is actually very simple. The collector will just go through each of those prior spaces and just calculates how much actual memory that these references, that these objects use. And when it finds that, uh, yeah, sorry. Very fast. And it'll do this in the priority that, you, that was dictated by this compare function. And when it finds that there's a, uh, and it'll free that structure according to that priority. So the lower the priority, the more likely it's to be evicted. And with, so we have this, essentially this edited garbage collector, but that doesn't really solve our cache problem on its own. So we implemented the stash, which is short for a space aware cache. And what this is is a data structure that uses the priorities, the prior space, to constrain memory usage for that data structure. It'll uh, use, it'll place the values in the prior space, and for its um, eviction policy, it'll make sure that newest references are given highest priority, and whenever you, there's a hit to the actual sash, that item gets highest priority. Basically, an ORU. And just so you know, this is what the sash looks like. It's just a hash map that also happens to have a prior space stuck in it. And so now we have an example of how we would use this sash in some program. So we're just gonna make a sash with a limit of 60 bytes, put three things in it, get something back and a GC will happen. On the right we have the current state of the heap, and I'm just gonna make a distinction of the items that are marked by the mark, the regular mark sweep, and the items that the prioritized GC specifically marks itself. So we start off, we make this map for 60 bytes, so now we know that this space has a limit of 60 bytes, and currently it's empty because we haven't put anything in it. Um, we're now gonna put in the key one with the uh, with the value D, and D is the root to some data structure, this list. And so we're gonna make a new prior reference called R1, put that in the space and associate it with D. Now we move on to the next item, which is key two value A. And we're just gonna do the same thing. We're gonna make the reference for that, R2, associate it with A. And we're gonna put the R2 at the head of the space because now that has highest priority, because it's newest. Then we go to the key three value H, and we do the same thing, make a new reference, set the head of the space, and finally, we get the value associated with one. And that doesn't change the heap, but it, allow, it forces R1 to be at the front of the space because it's the most recently accessed item. And then we do some work and a garbage collection occurs. And so now we switch over to the prioritized garbage collection. And the first thing we do is we mark all the, entr all the entries in the space, which means we're gonna try and mar we're gonna mark all these uh, prior references. So we mark R1, R3, and R2 in the priority order. Then we're gonna go off and mark all the roots in our program. In this case, I happens to be a root in our program. We're gonna do a depth first search from those roots. Our map is reachable, because we're currently using it. And we're gonna mark E. Note that we don't go past these references, because they've been already marked. And we leverage that fact, to s leverage that fact so that we know uh, that going through the map will not accidentally mark any of the structures we care about. And now we can do a depth search from the space entries, but we're gonna do it in 
the priority order, the order given by the space. So we're gonna start, we're gonna have this counter. We're gonna start with R1. We'll measure D. D happens to take up 12 bytes. So we mark that total. That doesn't exceed our limit, so we're gonna keep going. Mark F, another 12 bytes. Doesn't exceed, so on. You do the same thing B, you do the same G. And now we finish marking this entry, which takes up 48 bytes total. Our stash has not exceeded the, the space has not exceeded the limit, so we can keep this. Now we move on to R3, and we mark H. That has 12 bytes, and that's it. We don't mark E, because it was already marked earlier on in the, early on by, uh, it's marked live from the roots. So we're gonna say, so since we still haven't exceeded our limit, we're also gonna keep H. And finally, we start with, we go to R2, we're gonna mark A, and now we have exceeded our limit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop. And in fact, we're gonna know any references leaving A, and allow the sweep, and uh, well, any references leaving A, we're also going to remove the pointer to A from our reference, our reference, because now we don't want the programmer to have access to this partially live object. And the sweep will take care of the missing C, of the unmarked C. And now note that we're fine, that we're safe to actually get rid of the C because it wasn't marked live by anything else. It couldn't have marked, by, marked live by the roots, otherwise this would have been marked in reddish pink. So we're safe to do this. And now, once our sweep is done, the stash will actually evict the, R, the reference R2 at its next access. And that allows on the next sweep to actually clean up any leftover, uh, any leftover marked objects. And so that is the stash in a nutshell and how it uses prioritize GC. But we want to see how well it does. And so to do that, we ran an experiment where we made a bunch of traces. These are just basic string integer pairs. The string's just some unique identifier. It's not very important. What matters is the number, which is the, the size of the structure we want to create. And in, this is in terms of bytes. And we make this sure that the sequence follows a Pareto distribution, mostly because uh, Kuhn et al. found that web-based traces actually follow this distribution, and we want to follow, uh, we want to look at what is as something as close to web traces as we can while varying the size. Um, so our experiment, our program is trace-driven, so it's going to read in these requests, look them up in the cache. If it finds it, great, perfect. If it doesn't find it, uh, it creates and stores a tree of the specified size and puts it in the cache. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the actual cache that's used, and we compare it against two of them. We use the Google Guava cache using its LRU policy and left it fixed sizes. And we also compared it against, we compared it against the stash, which uses fixed percentages of a heap. And we implemented the prioritize GC and all this in the Jikes Research Virtual Machine. And so what we get is looking at one workload, which is ranges from 50 to 100 kilobyte trees, we see that the performance of the two are about the same for the most part. We see there as a point at the end that the stash is able to hold on to more elements than the Google, the Google cache is. But we also get a pretty good hit rate no matter where we are on the actual number of entries, which is exactly what we wanted. If we go on to larger, to actually larger workloads, we get a point that is definitely further out than the Google Quava cache itself, while still maintaining that good hit rate. So our stash is actually able to essentially adapt to all these, these uh, entries of different sizes, which is great. But programs aren't just caches. So we can say we have our folk heap here, and we have all this cache stuff. But again, like I said, programs aren't just caches. It's not just a cache and empty stuff. There's other live data, because programs do stuff, do things. And we would like that our program doesn't crash just because we have a cache in it. So this cache should be able, we think this cache should be able to essentially shrink or grow depending on how much space there is for us to use. And so that's what we set out to do. So we make this thing called an adaptive stash that's going to that's going to actually figure out what its size limit should be based on uh, a small heuristic, which is as follows. First, we're going to figure out how much live data we actually have. And then we're going to say, say, we reserve a bit of the heap, you know, for our live data to grow and do some more computation. And whatever happens to be left over, we're going to give to our stash. And if it so happens that the combination of these two takes up the whole heap, stash gets nothing. So to see how well this worked, 
we took our 50 to 100 kilobyte workload, which was the one I first presented, and after a third of those requests have been read, we're actually going to increase the memory pressure. Uh, this and after another third have been read, we're going to decrease the memory pressure. And we're going to see how the caches react. And we use um, the Google Vault cache with the same LRU policy, but we fixed it at 350 entries because that's where it worked best on this workload. So we're simulating the idea of someone ran these experiments and found the perfect size. And we use an adaptive stash with a reserve of 50%. So half the heap is automatically reserved for the program to just work. And we get this graph. So on the x-axis we have the actual memory pressure applied on the pr on each run in megabytes. On the y-axis we have the total runtime. And we see for a while that the, ca the Google, ca uh, Google Wallet cache and the sash are about the same, but after around 40 or so, they end up diverging. So we took the garbage collection to see are we to see uh, garbage collection time to see if that's taking up a lot of our uh, runtime, and it turns out yes. And after around the 40-50 mark, the Google Guava GC just explodes, while the SASH stays about the same. And in fact, what's interesting is there's this one point around 77 megabytes or so where the SASH has a point, but, but the Google Guava cache doesn't. So we wanted to see what exactly our adaptive SASH is doing at that point. And so we have this graph. The Y axis is the average number of entries that are in the SASH after a GC. And the x-axis essentially the mark is uh, moving forward in the program by counting which GC we're on. And what we see is this line, which is uh, this vertical line, which is after the first third of in red, is when we start applying memory pressure. And we see the sash adapting by shrinking how many entries it can hold until it just go uh, until it zeroes out and says, well, I'm not keeping anything after GC. And once you hit this second bar, which is when the ac we actually start relieving pressure, it starts to climb back up. So this tells us that our, our heuristic is doing exactly what we wanted to. It's actually adapting the sash in the way we wanted to. And so that's what I have. So in conclusion, um, we ha I presented the Bahari's garbage collection, which separates po the policy of how to do managed references from the mechanism that actually manages them. And with that, we built this basic where cache called the sash to enforce the memory limits on the values that it stores. And we can also show that we can with the, all that, we can also adapt the sash in response to memory pressure in the program, which improve, which has allows us to improve the robustness of that program. And with that, happy to take any questions. <laughs>